Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to King's College London and the 48th Strain Group. I'm the director, John Davis. Uh, tonight, we're on a search for global Britain with a seminar based upon Professor Balls and his team's Harvard paper published today. What does it all mean for our country, for our economy, for our society? To discuss it, we're delighted to welcome Lord Johnson, Lord McPherson, and Emily Thornbury, MP. But first, to set out the report, Finding Global Britain from Political Slogan to Hard Economic Policy Choices, I'll, ho I'll hand over to Professor Balls. Ed. Thank you very much indeed, uh, John. And let me just introduce my other co-authors. There's um, a team of four people with me who have been working on this since the, the summer. Two of them are going to be um, involved in the presentation today, Nasha Weinberg and Tommaso Coyati, and Jessica Redmond and Sechi Klasser, um, who did the seminar last week at Harvard, uh, are with us and can be part of the discussion to, uh, to follow. Uh, we're really grateful to the Strand Group, um, to John and the team for hosting uh, this event for us again today. This is the sixth paper in a series of Harvard King's papers, which we've done looking at um, the, uh, the, the impact of Brexit, looking forward on British business and wider economic uh, policy. And we're gonna do a, a presentation of the paper first for about uh, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, and then I think we're gonna hear from our three discussants. And we're really grateful um, to have um, Emily, um, Nick and Joe Johnson um, to, to be part of our discussion today. We have a former cabinet minister, we have the shadow um, trade secretary and a former treasury permanent secretary. So they're all very well qualified to talk about this, um, this subject. But first of all, I'm going to introduce the slides and then hand over to, um, to, to Nyasha and Tommaso to take us through. So, um, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. We've been, um, been negotiating um, a trade deal with the European Union following the, um, the referendum. But we are entering um, a, a new era. Britain outside uh, the European Union, outside a tight trade bloc. Um, still a member of the G7, the G20, now with a seat at the WTO table, chairing the COP talks uh, this year. Um, it is a new beginning for the UK, a new era. It's been declared by uh, Theresa May when Prime Minister, a truly global Britain. Boris Johnson, the beginning of this year, um, said on Twitter, the UK is taking over the 2021 presidency of the G7 today, um, making this a hugely important year for global Britain. But the question is, as we're asking today, what does global Britain mean? And I think uh, over the last few years, following the 2016 referendum, the debate has continued to be typically polarised. On the one hand, much of the, the rhetoric around the declaring of global Britain has felt quite, um, quite celebratory, but also quite backward looking. Britain unchained, outside the EU, able to, to re-engage with its Commonwealth history and heritage to stride the world. That's the hubristic Imperial Britain version. But on the other side of the spectrum, from those who, um, who were, were not advocating Britain's departure from the European Union, you often hear a much more pessimistic view that Britain is now diminished, much less powerful, less influential, into a period of political and economic decline without clout or economic and, um, and wider international policy. Um, the Foreign Affairs Committee looked at this question a couple of years ago. The only thing that is clear about global Britain is that it is unclear what it means, what it stands for, or how its success should be measured was their conclusion then. At the time, sketch writer, um, in a rather more playful way, texted just a couple of weeks ago, big relief to hear Preeti Patel on the radio explaining that Britain is at the forefront of global Britain. Imagine how embarrassing it would be if somewhere else was. France, maybe? Awful. So, nobody's quite sure what this global Britain means, and that's what we set out to answer in our paper. Over to Nyasha. You're on mute, Nasha. Someone had to do it. <laughs> Excellent. So in order to answer the question of what global Britain is, we adopted the methodology that we'd used for our previous five papers, which is going to stakeholders across a range of different areas, policy, academia, trade, 
business in order to ask them exactly what Global Britain meant for them. But in this paper, we did something a little different. We wanted to go beyond those who are stakeholders in the UK to ask senior policymakers from other countries. We used Australia, Singapore and Canada because they're medium sized, globally significant countries with membership of the G20 and G7 to find out what their experience is, have been and what advice they would offer to global Britain. And we kind of give their views in the paper. So what we heard conclusively was that it was time to reject the negative narrative of Britain fully diminished. The UK continues to have the economic clout, the position in international institutions, the sectoral expertise, and a load of other assets, which means that the UK can continue to thrive. As the graph here shows, the UK remains the world's second largest service exporter. Kevin Ellis, chairman of PwC UK told us, the UK has every opportunity to strengthen its position as a dynamic and trusted place for business. We were told by a senior Bank of England official, the UK machine is good at operating an international fora and remains pretty powerful. We have good ideas and good networks. But rejecting Britain diminished doesn't mean adopting a version of 19th century imperial Britain. The world has changed over the course of the last 200 years. The UK is predominantly not an industrial powerhouse and we cannot ignore the realities of the UK's current position within Europe. The global landscape of trade has also altered. The UK's share of global trade has fallen sharply but also the proportion of that trade, which is comprised of services, has grown significantly over time. We are told by Thomas Sampson at LSE, the UK is too small a country, both economically and militarily, to try and take the kind of role of the US, China, India, or that the EU could take. Andy Burwell from the CBI said, if the UK wants to shape the future global environment, it can only do so through alliances and collective action. Linking foreign policy to trade sounds very colonial. So when we were trying to find something between these two extremes, a pragmatic global Britain, we were thinking about what those building blocks were. And we chanced on four different areas, trade, migration, global rules of the game, including regulation, and the domestic leveling up agenda, because Global Britain is not just about what happens overseas, but is also about international perceptions of what is happening at home and whether those in the UK accept the broader Global Britain agenda and sees it translating into benefits for them. Those four areas have to be surrounded by a narrative or a story of Global Britain that makes sense. On the area of trade, we asked our interviewees three different questions. Should the UK prioritise multilateral, bilateral or plurilateral deals? Will UK trade behaviour be collaborative, conciliatory or adversarial? And how should trade be prioritised against other domestic outcomes? From our UK interviews, we heard the follow following. Senior UK Treasury official. Nobody is particularly optimistic about multilateral trade or reviving the WTO. People will talk about it, but there's no real sense that it will happen quickly. Senior UK government official. Things won't move forward on the multilateral front. So the implication is to do things bilaterally or plurilaterally. I can imagine a plurilateral initiative in services. David Wright, former EU commission official. I see nothing wrong with building out from coalitions of the willing, but global trade cannot operate without a dispute settlement mechanism. Brussels-based foreign office official. The EU will be watching UK attempts to build more Pacific facing relationships like a hawk. From our international interviewees, Wayne Swan. When looking at trade strategies at this minute, it's a pretty murky world. It's fair to say that there is much to learn about how to operate in a less friendly world. Thumb and Shanmugaratnam, Senior Minister of Singapore. 
we have to build multiple relationships, including bilateral and plurilateral ones, like the US, China and Europe have themselves been pursuing, but ensure that those provide pathways to multilateralism. But the UK should be careful that economic integration with Europe is not damaged because that is the nature of your economy, your businesses, and therefore your jobs. Mark Carney, Canada, Singapore and Switzerland will be persuadable on services. The UK should convince the US that service liberalisation is the way to get a decent trade surplus with China. So based on these quotes and the others which are contained within the paper, we came to the following conclusions. Reviving multilateral trade is a difficult long-term challenge, but bilateral deals are too narrow to offer significant upside benefit. Plurilateral deals have more immediate potential, particularly in services, and can be stepping stones towards multilateralism. The US and EU may be reluctant to engage in a new push on service sector liberalisation, but the UK should keep the door open. An adversarial approach with the EU is not in the UK's interest. New trading relationships must not alienate our most significant partner. Trading relations which deliver domestic outcomes and greater equality should be prioritised, for example, support for SMEs. On global rules of the game, we ask the following questions. What is the UK's post-Brexit regulatory philosophy? On which global issues should the UK take a leadership position? Where should the UK diverge or remain within the EU regulatory orbit? From domestic interviewees, we heard the following. Senior Downing Street official. We're bigger than Singapore and Canada and more confident as a global player than Japan. Between the US and the EU, we must be smart and nimble. Tony Denker, CBI. Britain needs a leaps frog strategy. Using its regulatory freedoms to get to the world of 2030 faster, rather than simply thinking how to show Brussels that this has all been worth it. Senior Bank of England official. If you can show that something works in a fairly chunky mid-sized economy that's globally integrated, that's powerful. Simon Usherwood, University of Surrey. In practice, like it or not, we will have to broadly follow EU rules. Senior European Commission official. There are certainly some areas where the UK leads and I can see that you might wish to be at the forefront of international processes. The Omen, Sham Magratnam. One of the opportunities for bilateral and plurilateral deals now comprises enabling and spurring digital connectivity. Mark Carney, there's a period of time where there may be some issues, such as data privacy, you can't do without the EU. I'd advocate others to lead on services liberalisation, for example, so it doesn't look like a direct UK confrontation with the EU. Maria de Mertzis, Bruegel, Bruegel think tank. When the political dust settles, then we will realise that the UK, regulation-wise, is a lot closer to the EU than it thinks. So from our interviews, we came to the, the following conclusions. The UK is too small to impose its regulatory approach on the world and too large to simply be a rule taker. Brokerage and innovation offer an alternative. The UK's expertise, experience and international standing in financial services, climate change, technology and global taxation are areas for brokerage. The G7 presidency demands UK leadership on COVID recovery, technolo technology and multilateral tax reform. COP will be a second big test of global Britain. As one of the lead, largest donors to COVAX, a leader in the vaccination race, and with its world leading life sciences sector, the UK can drive post pandemic resilience. Regulatory divergence from the EU is challenging, but leading or brokering regulatory reform requires risk taking. In financial services, there are opportunities. In data privacy, the risk of antagonizing the EU may be too great. I'm going to hand over to Tommaso for migration.
I was muted as well. <laughs> now we move to our uh, migration section where we ask three questions. What kinds of migration does the UK need? What should the UK's approach to migration be? And what is the global story on migration? From a domestic interviewees, we heard the following. Senior Downing Street official. Our points-based migration system is deliberately designed to make it easier for high-skilled immigrants to come in and more difficult for low-skilled. Senior Bank of England official. Free movement as a slogan was disastrous as people felt like there was no control. By changing the rhetoric to grip and control, similar to Australia, the UK can set quite an open immigration policy whilst letting people feel it is under control. Joe Johnson, former cabinet minister, even if you've still got net migration of 300,000 plus a year, that doesn't matter anymore because we're in control. Camilla Cavendish, former Downing Street policy chief, there will still be a residual Brexit effect of people wanting to see evidence of control through lower numbers, especially if welfare queues lengthen post COVID. From our international interviews, we heard a similar range of views. Mark Carney, effective inward migration policy has been demand driven in the UK. It's a totally different cultural history in Canada where immigration is really welcome. Tharman Shanmugaratnam, good immigration policy must be aligned to maximizing jobs at home. In Singapore, this means being very liberal at the top of the skills ladder, but being more cautious in the middle and paying close attention to whether employers are really giving a fair opportunity to local candidates. Wayne Swan, we've managed to avoid the full-scale revolt against, against migration that has been seen elsewhere. The implication of the point system is that we have chosen the people who come in. Maria de Mertzis, the UK was a big supplier of labor, a flow that will be undoubtedly disrupted in the short run. Our conclusions on migration are the following. Ending free movement with the EU doesn't mean closing borders. Indeed, the government accepts the need for high-skilled labor. Migration policy also requires choices on how global Britain does three things. Responds to shortages of low-skilled and seasonal workers, supports higher education, and faces up to Britain's aging population. To sustain support for migration, the government must persuade the public that there is effective and fair control over migration. And finally, the narrative on managing migration will shape how global Britain is seen by potential and remaining migrants, as well as domestic voters. Now we move to the domestic leveling up agenda, where we also ask three questions. What is the global Britain strategy for promoting growth and leveling up? Should Britain level up through freer trade or through more controls on trade? And what examples can the UK show, show the world about managing globalization? Our domestic interviewees told us the following. A senior Downing Street official, the only way the UK can square its free trading market-based approach is to, quite a, is, is to be quite a lot less free trade market when it comes to regional growth. Tom Riordan, the chief executive of, of the Leeds City Council. London cannot survive on its own. The UK cannot just be about the capital. The reason London can be what it is, is because of the other parts of Britain. Sajid Javid. There's nothing wrong with shifting jobs from an area of high employment to an area of low employment to improve equity across the country. David Wright. It looks like the Scots are going to go and Northern Ireland might also decide to leave. You can't play a global Britain role while the country is disintegrating. From our international interviewees, we heard the following. Rem Kortweg from the Kligendal Institute. Global Britain has to first clear the pretty high bar of not becoming global England. Mark Carney. We should build thresholds up to a certain size for SMEs to achieve distributed globalization. Through this, the UK can also keep sovereignty in terms of rules, hygiene, and financial stability. Tharman Shanmugaratnam. Global Britain must enable growth in incomes across the board, including the middle. That has to be about constant investment in human capital and inclusive growth. It's also a truism in large countries that you have to regenerate localities across the board to avoid self-reinforcing declines and Brexit-like perceptions of who is gaining and who is losing. 
And these are our conclusions on the domestic leveling up agenda. Delivering fair domestic outcomes, both regionally and between cities and towns, is vital for global Britain. Our interviewees rejected simply undercutting international competition and instead advocated investing in innovation, skills, infrastructure, and trade adjustment assistance. The UK must replace European policies on state aid and agricultural policy and find a new constitutional settlement to sustain the union. Other countries will be watching closely. The economic and political divides that global Britain must tackle are common to many countries around the world. Our last building block is the narrative that needs to support this new global Britain agenda. And, this, and here we ask two questions. Why does narrative matter? And what can other countries teach Britain? Our domestic interviewees told us the following. Brussels-based foreign, foreign office official. Global Britain has been around for a long time. It doesn't communicate terribly well. We simply state we want global reach. As a consequence, it seems hubristic rather than that we merit global reach through hard work. Paul Tucker. It is tremendously important not to talk about global Britain in a nationalistic way, as what the rest of the world will hear is nationalism rather than openness. There's a risk that global Britain sounds bombastic to serious, pe to serious people in other capital. A senior, a senior treasury official told us, there's been a lot of hubris in British politics in recent years. Whatever the shenanigans in parliament, the, tre the treasury has successfully presented itself as a sensible player internationally, but this won't last forever. Our international interviewees told us the following. Wayne Swan, if the UK did a roadshow about returning to a world of Commonwealth trading relationships to launch Global Britain, that would be spectacularly unsuccessful and in itself harmful. A senior European Commission official. It's difficult to foresee anyone trusting a version of the UK as a leader or broker when it has just abandoned its opportunity to do brokerage in the deepest international agreement, the EU. Mark Carney, you need to let the big blocks get the glory. That's easy if you're Canada, you're just glad to be at the table, but it's much harder for the UK, which used to be an empire and world power. The UK needs to be tactical and appropriately humble. And these are our conclusions on uh, the narrative to support global Britain. This year, Britain will begin to develop its narrative through its response to COVID-19 in the G7 and the vaccine rollout, climate policy at COP26, and decisions on migration and leveling up. Our international interviewees advise that, that the global Britain narrative needs to be three things, outward looking and collaborative, not adversarial, humble, not arrogant, consistent between international and domestic audiences. Our UK interviews stress that hubris and pessimism risk undermining the global Britain narrative. And the global Britain must show the public and the world it is addressing international divides within the UK. I'll hand it over to Ed now for our overall conclusions of the paper. This is our final slide before we hand over to the discussants. And uh, I think what was very striking to us in the, the, the work which we did was how for many of the people we spoke to, um, they felt as though the debate had been stuck uh, in a rather backward looking perspective, looking back to 2016. But this is a new chapter in our history. And there are big questions which now need to be faced up to uh, on trade, um, the, the way in which we go about our trade policy, plurilateral, bilateral, or multilateral, on regulation, the prioritise that, um, that we choose, on migration, how we issue, uh, how we handle the issue of unskilled labour, um, and also um, the way in which the government pursues levelling up and these narrative questions. But it was very clear from all of our conversations that Global Britain therefore has to be about much more than trade policy in the economic realm, about regulation, migration, domestic levelling up will also define its success. To be effective, the UK has to combine outward ambition with humility and a realistic assessment of Britain's priorities and place in the world. We thought it was interesting to reflect on the public health challenge and the vaccine challenge of the last year. On the one hand, the UK now has a huge opportunity to, um, to show what global Britain means through our leadership on the vaccine issue, to build alliances to make sure the widest number of countries and populations 
can um, can get um, support in the vaccine over the coming months and, and years. But on the other hand, the beginning of the pandemic a year ago, much of the message of the messaging from not just the government but experts was um, the wrong kind of global Britain. We know best. We don't need to learn from other countries to listen to the WTO on large crowds or on um, uh, uh, or on face masks. That kind of inward looking no best, rather arrogant approach to global Britain is not the right way to proceed. But we now have a new opportunity in 2021. And finally, this is going to be the political debate between now and the next general election. And parties across the political spectrum now need to mould the global Britain of their choosing in policy and in, in narrative. The, ten, the temptation for the Prime Minister will be to play to those parts of his party who would rather go for the backward-looking, hubristic, celebratory, Britain knows best approach. But as is clear from this presentation, that is not only not going to work, but it will alienate many of our international partners. But it's also a challenge for Labour as well. There will be pressure on Keir Starmer from some in his party to want to take the pessimistic view, to fight the, the past battles again, to say that Brexit was the disaster and that is what um, the, the party should focus on. But I think it's clear from the stance Keir Starmer is taking, he's looking beyond Bre Brexit and forward. He can't allow Boris Johnson to own the word global or to own the world Britain. And how Labour sets out its vision, a different vision, maybe a more progressive vision, maybe a more internationalist vision of global Britain will define the political choice in the, the years to, to come. So, um, Thank you very much indeed for listening to us, and we'll hand over to you to John for the discussions. Thank you very much, uh, Ed, Nyasha, and Tommaso. Um, questions uh, are starting to come in. Could you please uh, uh, just put um, if you if there's an organisation that you're representing, just put it in the question there, and also if you're directing uh, the question to a particular discussant. And uh, let's move over to the discussants. Can I hand over to Lord Johnson? Over to you, thank you. Great, well, um, congratulations on this great paper and hugely timely ahead of the government's own reflections on this question in the expected integrated review that's, that I think is gonna be coming out in the next couple of weeks. So, so I'm sure you've given them a bit of an opportunity to look at your thinking. Um, I mean, from my perspective, the government's got two really big ideas. It's got the leveling up agenda and it's got the global Britain concept. And I think the challenge uh, to my mind is how the government can ensure that they don't undermine each other and that they actually work together to support each other. Because there is clearly, I think, a potential for the leveling up agenda if it's seen to be couched in terms of helping communities that have been left behind uh, communities that have sort of struggled in an era of globalization, if that lends itself towards uh, protectionism, place-based policies, and that sort of agenda to undermine the idea that the government is at the same time championing free trade and the buccaneering deregulation um, of the whole sort of Brexit project. So that is a real challenge, is how you can get these two big ideas to work in a mutually supportive way and I think the answer to that is to actually go back to the last government buzzword which was the global race which is a sort of a precursor of, of global Britain which was a, a slogan which was popular in about 2012, 2013, 2014 um, when George Osborne and David Cameron saw the need to get sort of match fit, to get the British economy and our skills base match fit so that we could compete around the world and earn our place um, at the world table. And I think that's quite an important part of you know, what, what Global Britain actually needs to be successful is the idea that we need to earn our place in the world and that we need to get out there and get match fit in doing so. And that will require on the levelling up agenda, heavy investment in skills, heavy investment in, in training, uh, investment into hard and soft infrastructure, schools, the hospitals, as well as the physical infrastructure of, 
you know, ports, railways, airports, and so forth. So I think, you know, there is a way of making these two big ideas consistent so that Global Britain and, and levelling up work together in a mutually supportive way. I'm not sure yet um, that the government is articulating um, a clear vision for how that can work. I think the tensions uh, within the Conservative Party as to you know, which dominates, whether it's the Red Wall MPs wanting heavy uh, protection for you know, communities uh, that, have had, that have been at the hard end of globalization versus the more sort of buccaneering southern uh, MPs who are all ready to support our, uh, our free trading ambitions, I think are still very real and yet to be resolved. But I think if the government can uh, get these two ideas to work together uh, in a consistent and mutually supportive way, then it's onto something pretty exciting. That's lovely. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lord McPherson. Thank you very much. Um, I, I thought this is a great paper, great quotes, even, even though some of them are anonymous. Obviously, I particularly like the one from the former Treasury official. No, not the former Treasury official, the Treasury official. Um, look, I, I, I share the analysis of this paper. I think, um, I think there are huge opportunities for Britain in the coming period um, if we pursue the right policies. Um, I mean, we know Brexit's creating friction, but actually the, the, the reduction in national income, which Brexit is creating, is, is small if you can pursue sensible growth policies. So, I mean, my first point is um, it's really important that Britain remains open. Um, as Joe just hinted at, um, a lot of the instincts of um of of the current government are protectionist and um the most important thing is to have a sensible approach to services because services account for something like 80 percent of our economy and i think we can make a fetish of um free so-called free trade deals um when it comes to services but actually since services tend the the origination of services tends to be within the UK. In some ways, uh, free trade agreements are a, are a red herring. If you want to have a successful service sector, you need to have the best people, whether it's in fintech, the creative industries, or, or biotech. And I know this is something which uh, the Home Secretary, no doubt, has difficulties with, but we need to have a sensible uh, migration regime which can allow talented people to operate here without incurring massive fees, endless bureaucracy, and so on. I don't expect that to be sorted out immediately because uh, I think this government would find all that too difficult, but I think it's something which uh, liberal forces in a liberal coalition within Britain could um, get behind and support. I mean, the second point I'd make comes back to, to growth. I mean, the great irony about politics is politics is all about difference. But if you look at the growth strategies, as I had the good fortune to do at first hand, of Ken Clark, Gordon Brown, George Osborne, and, and for all I know, Rishi Sunak, certainly Joe Johnson, um, they have remarkable similarity. This is all about creating sensible... Uh, a sensible regime for competition. It's about promoting innovation. It's about investment, and above all, and it's about a, sex, a, a, a sensible tax system. But above all, it's about having a sensible approach to skills. And um, Joe Johnson knows that. Ed Balls knows that. They're on different sides of the political spectrum, but they were both fully committed to doing it. And actually, if we spent a little less time rearranging deck chairs in terms of reorganizations, because that's what politicians like, because you can do that immediately. Actually delivering, delivery, relentless focus on delivery takes years, decades. If we could create a cross-party coalition to support 
a really good approach to further education, which has always been deprived of resources, I think that would make the biggest difference to the so-called levelling up agenda. Third point I'd make is we need to keep the United Kingdom together. Now, I'm worried about um, the success of English nationalism in recent years in terms of its impact on the rest of this great kingdom in which we reside. And I know many people in the English Nationalist Party, um, also known as the Conservative Party, um, uh, want to be rid of Scotland. Um, they'd be very foolish if they did get rid of Scotland. Um, Scotland spent many hundreds of years um, causing irritation to England. And actually, Scotland has been the source of most of, well, not most, but certainly a disproportionate amount of the good things which have happened to, for the UK. So keeping that together, keeping Britain's role in the world by keeping the union together is really important. And um, the next few years are going to be um, critical to that. So, I mean, as I said, I started by saying I'm an optimist. I think if we can pursue the right policies, keep the UK together, we were never properly in the European Union. Um, we weren't in Schengen. We weren't in the euro. So we shouldn't make a fetish about Brexit. And I'm optimistic that when the forces of reason, the forces of liberal free trade, the forces of progress recombine to create the same sort of coalition which Gladstone did after the Corn Laws, which um, Attlee and Churchill did after the disasters of Chamberlain Knight Empire Preference Protection, I'm convinced that there can be a new coalition across politics which will promote free trade and progress. Thank you, Nick. Emily. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much, John. And thank you, Ed, and everybody at King's for inviting me um, to join you this evening. And, and, and to all those responsible for this timely and fascinating report, well done. Um, I think you have to go over, if you look back over the last few years since you started producing these reports in the wake of the Brexit referendum, and you may not thank me for describing it like this, but I think that the whole series could be subtitled advice we'd wished we'd given the government and we wish that they'd had time to listen to it. But they, they certainly do have that kind of quality about them and this latest report is a fine addition to that series. Um, obviously in my current role as Shadow Secretary of State for International Trade, I'm particularly interested in the collection of interviews conducted on the issue of trade. But as the Shadow Foreign Secretary back in 2016-17, when Boris Johnson was my opponent and was setting out his vision for global Britain. I'm also fascinated, if not surprised, that four years on, here we are still debating the questions which I asked him then, namely, what does this mean in practice and how are you going to deliver it, Boris? Um, actually, I've been reminded that I was probably a bit ruder than that, actually. <laughs> I think I may have told Boris that he was behaving like Tinkerbell and telling us that global Britain was... Just, uh, it would just happen if we just all closed our eyes and believed strongly enough. But, but, but whilst I was kind of joking about that in 2017, I do think that I was also making a pretty serious point about, about this, about the belief in this idea as opposed to the concrete reality. And it's something which reading this new pamphlet has brought home to me. Because I mean, here's, here's really the core of it, which is this. Um, I don't think it's really, I don't think it's a partisan sentiment to say what I'm about to say. I think it's just a statement of fact, actually. But when we look at what we are currently going through with our exports of goods to Europe, and when we start to see the impact of the new restrictions on our ability, our service industries, you know, to do business with the continent, I think that fact is that we are going to be going through quite a lot of pain. And we've chosen as a country um, to go through that pain because of the fervent belief that this government has, that it has a clear electoral mandate for their belief, and that the gains to be had from us doing free trade deals with the rest of the world will, in the end, outweigh the losses from damaging our trading relationships with Europe. And that's kind of it. 
and, and it's a fundamental leap of faith that this government has been involved in. And I believe that that's the core of what is developing behind when they say that we want to have a global Britain. And even if many of us who are taking part in this event and many of the contributors to this pamphlet have strongly disagreed with that argument in recent years, we are now all in a position where for the good of the country, we have to hope that we are proved wrong and that global Britain believers are proved right. But I think, I think that what this pamphlet points out in a very measured and thoughtful way with no hyperbole and no political point scoring is that it's gonna be very, very difficult to ensure that that leap of faith ends in a successful landing. And that's because, you know, first as, as um, we, didn't, um, we didn't have it on the, on the display, but if you look at figures seven and eight in this report, uh, it shows that the deals that are being discussed with great fanfare by the government doesn't deliver the size of gains that we would need to make up for the losses with Europe. And second, I don't think that those deals break enough new ground, as has already been said, in terms of increasing service sector exports. Um, and that is a, a, the core of our economy, and we do need to find a way through that. Um, we need to have you know, deals that, that help small businesses to expand, and we're not getting that. And I think we also need to attract more inward investment and we can't say that that's happening either. So thirdly, I, I also think that, I also think, I also don't think that they've addressed the fundamental question um, that uh, some of these new deals, which is what are we prepared to give away to make that happen? I mean, in any trade deal, there will, there'll be winners and losers. Um, but I don't think that the current government is prepared to even straightforward about that they think that you know any trade deal will mean that everybody wins it isn't how it works and while I talk about giving things away I don't just mean the debates about standards on food safety and animal welfare or access to NHS patient data the sort of stuff that we've been talking about in relation to the US deal I also mean I also mean what we're giving what we've been giving away in terms of the issues that we decide not to care about so uh, environmental protection in the deal with Brazil or human rights in deals with the Gulf states or workers' rights in deals with Turkey. If we decide not to care about those issues, the kind of issues that are talked about in the report by Rosa Crawford from the TUC or Laura from British Ceramics, then I have to say, you know, what does that failure to care say about the other side of global Britain? the global Britain that's about standing up for a world order based on rules and values, which is what I always thought was what we should be proud of as a country. And I can predict, frankly, with absolute confidence right now, and, and I think it's another simple statement of fact, that we will spend a great deal more time in Parliament over the next two or three years debating the issues that I've just mentioned about the consequences of our future trade deals from human rights, animal welfare, rather than debating any of the other fundamental issues examined in this pamphlet, which is about what kind of future trade deals we should be doing, bilateral, plurilateral, about how we make those future trade deals work uh, for, our, for our strengths as a country, for the service sector, investment, small business, and finally, most importantly, about how we improve and repair our trading relationship with Europe given it remains the most important one that we have. And as I said in this report, nearly half of our trade is with the European Union, and that remains the same. And I have to say, I learned a, um, a, uh, a word from trade theory that I didn't know before, which is gravity. The gravity of being just simply pulled to our closest neighbours and the effect of that on our trade. Anyway, the reason that these issues will not be given the time or the priority that they deserve in discussions we have in Parliament is because this government is so clearly now in such a hurry. They have bet the farm on global Britain before even realising what it was that it meant. And now they need to start showing that it's paying off without really knowing how to deliver that. Which is why we're having the trouble that we're having, for example, with the trade bill. You know, the trade bill, which has been going, I've got a copy of it on just on my shelf here. Uh, the original one was dated 2018. 
three years on, we're still we're still in hand to hand combat on the trade bill because the government wanted it to be a vehicle for simply um, setting up um, our you know nuts and bolts for our absolute basics for our new trade policy. You know, new trade policy, first time in fifty years. Um, we thought, and many others, frankly, thought that it, the trade bill should be an opportunity for democratizing the decisions that are going to be made about trade so that we can collect people's knowledge, so that we can make sure that the sectors are actually consulted and so that we can have a proper debate before we make trade deals. That isn't what they want. It's also why, instead of stopping and reading this pamphlet and listening to the advice that it gives the government and thinking about the next step in this process, they are chasing around the world looking for quick wins. Um, Dominic Gowdy from the Food and Drink Federation. And remember, you know, the Food and Drink Federation actually represent the, the biggest industrial sector in Britain. Anyway, he puts it very well in this report. Um, he says, there's a rush to act, he says, uh, rather than working out what's best for us. And so that brings us full circle. We, will we look back on this report and say, advice we'll wish the government had listened to at that time. I think we absolutely will. Even before, even, even more than that, even more than that, I think, you know, when you look at this report right now and you say, these are the issues that the government should have been thinking about four and a half years ago, when they first spoke about global Britain and when they were first asked to explain what they meant. And I could forgive them all of that. I could even forgive Boris for not thinking about those issues then, as long as they get on with it and realize their mistake and start thinking about it now and start listening to people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, rich opinion and detail all round. Uh, from, from myself, I keep asking, uh, I keep thinking that one of the uh, essay questions I'm gonna see an awful lot of in the future is, uh, uh, is it true that people uh, didn't vote Brexit to be poorer? Keeps going around my head. Anyway, uh, Ed, would you like to uh, respond before we throw it out to further questions? Ed? With you, sorry about that. There we are. Bit, bit of Zoom innocence. Um, we've got loads of questions coming in, but, um, but let me just say something first, because actually they were three really different and thoughtful Kind of responses and in a way um i was kind of struck by joe and emily's i mean although they were asking questions and emily was critiquing um they both share the idea that britain should be outward looking um and internationalist and i'm sure they both share the view that we ought to be tackling regional um divides and if those two prevail, we would actually return to you know, a more conventional kind of politics where there is a, a right of centre view of what global Britain should be and a left of centre view about what global Britain should be, with different conceptions of the role of the state and justice and public spending. And we can kind of argue that out and, um, and see who can win the argument. And the thing that I thought was striking in with Nick's contribution is that he was rather more pessimistic because he doesn't think that's how things are going to to work through and therefore we need some some new force to emerge from the the center ground and i guess that is kind of probably because he's been a bit burned by watching politics over the last few years although we had a coalition government for a few years the reality is our politics has always been based upon coalitions our main political parties have always been coalitions of different in, interests and our political parties work function best when they have a galvanizing view, which is so uniting that it brings together within that party and it gets over other differences. And you can see how Emily could galvanize a Labour view of global Britain, which is very different from a Conservative view. And Joe could galvanize a Conservative view of global, global Britain, which is galvanizing and brings people together. Um, you can see how that could be done. But I think Nick's a pessimist because I think he looks at um, the the Prime Minister and the way the Conservative Party got the last few years, as I heard him, and thinks that isn't how it will turn out. Because the reality is in recent years, both of our political parties have been pulling apart to some extent. We know all about the, 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 the hard Brexiteers and the Conservative Party. We know all about the challenge of um, the Red Wall um, 
the vote on the Labour side. And for Boris Johnson, the danger is that what he does to hold his party together is he doubles down on a very hubristic, backward-looking, nationalist, sort of little Englander view of conservatism, which we say in our paper will be a disaster for us on the international stage, but he could do that to keep his party together. And Labour, Labour could decide not to talk about this too much, because actually there's other things which are easier to talk about and trying to find a way to reconcile Labour's position on post-Brexit is also quite hard. And therefore they leave the pitch clear and Boris Johnson ends up defining global Britain as this, sort of, as I said, rather narrow, backward-looking, adversarial, hubristic view, which then takes you to the second point Nick made, which is about the union. I mean, it, tr trade theory and gravity theory says you've got to have really good relationship with your close economic neighbours. And for England, that's Scotland. And for England and Scotland, that's the European Union. And if you have a, a, an economic vision, it doesn't see the importance of a really close relationship with England and Scotland and working really closely with, with Europe outside the European Union, that is obviously economically not sensible, but it jars with that little Englander uh, view that devolution was a mistake. That the um, I, I think that the if you take the last year on COVID, the dissonance between the English view on public health and the Scottish view on public health has been damaging to the future of the European Union. And if the government was to take a vote view of the vaccine, which is the Europeans are no good and we were better instead, that's also damaging to the union. And the only thing which actually can save the union is a view from Westminster, which is actually, which starts from the strength of the union and the importance of us having sort of a, a good international relationships with our main trading partner, which is, is, is Europe and not that sort of nationalistic little England of view. So if Nick is right, that little England of conservatism will prevail, Nick is also right that the union will go. And the union will only be saying by actually the two main political parties arguing out different views about what global Britain could mean, not global England. That has also got to be within it, more power and devolution for Scotland and Wales and the English regions as a way of making people feel that they have a say in this future of global Britain. So the choice is, if, if the Conservatives, if Boris Johnson fights um, global Britain, like the Brexit campaign, it's a disaster, including for the Union. And if Labour doesn't engage on what global Britain can be, a Labour version of global Britain, it's, I think it's a disaster for the Union as well. So let's hope that Joe and Emily prevail within their party. Thank you. OK, well, I'm going to start to um, bring in some questions from uh, our audience, which got up to 186, I think it was, 180, 188. Um, OK, uh, now, I know that Scotland has come up and we're, doing, we're talking about it a lot, but there are several questions from the audience on this, OK? So maybe somebody who hasn't touched on Scotland might want to answer these. So uh, Chris Sybil, good evening, Chris. Uh, from Finsbury Glover Herring, uh, says, thanks, great presentation. What impact will the campaign for an independent Scotland have on the success of a global Britain? The departure of Scotland and emerging issues in Wales and Northern Ireland make for a much diminished Britain, whether it be politically, economic or culturally. Uh, and our great friend, Dr. Martin Farr of Newcastle University, who I understand has brought around 20 undergraduates to this event, uh, says, uh, if a new constitutional settlement fails to sustain the union, how seriously might the unravelling of the UK affect global Britain? I, I think basically the question is here, um, if Scotland decides to go, uh, potentially followed by the other constituent nations, uh, is global Britain finished? Um, Lord Johnson, would you like to answer that? Um, sure. I mean, I think one of the reasons why I'm optimistic um, right now is that immigration is losing its salience in British politics. And I think that's going to be a supportive factor for the union. I think it was one of the uh, questions that sort of put English politics on a slightly different trajectory to Scottish politics, where there was more of a consensus 
around the benefits of immigration. Whereas in, in English politics, there was almost a consensus from the late Blair era onwards with the Conservative Party that immigration needed to be managed, controlled, and, and, and driven down. And so I think the fact that Brexit has given us this sense because freedom of movement has ended, that we've got greater control over immigration, that there's more democratic consent to what happens by chance or, or not to be more or less the same levels of net migration is, is a really important one because there is now uh, a situation where immigration really isn't a big factor. It's, it's not a top three issue uh, when voters are asked what's bothering them today. Whereas it was very clearly uh, in the in the run up to uh, the referendum for the ten, for the decade uh, from two thousand and four uh, to the referendum in twenty sixteen, it was very clearly a top three issue. It no longer is, and I think that's a really really important change. I think you know what to my mind is one of the most fascinating processes that's going on right now is you know the the process by which the government is seeking to demonstrate the benefits of Brexit. And, you know, we are seeing, you know, the, the project being tested now when we're, we're living Brexit and the government is under pressure to find examples of, of how it can clearly be shown to benefit people. Um, and I'm going to be watching very closely the progress of, you know, things like Ian Duncan Smith's task force on innovation, growth and regulatory reform, you know, the TIGER, Initiative, which is which is I'm told going to you know, find lots of examples of regulations and red tape that a British business has been subjected to, and I, I wish I wish him well. I really do in this respect. Um, all I would say is that when um, the Cameron government was undertaking a similar exercise in the run up to uh, the so-called reform part of his project in 2013, 2014. And he pitched very clearly, you know, this idea that we were going to reform the EU. We were going to go, go to our partners in, in Brussels and say, listen, here are lots of examples of regulations and red tape emanating from Brussels, which we need to take off our statute book and uh, make Europe more competitive and enable us to win the global race together uh, as, 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 as Britain in Europe, Britain at the heart of Europe. And... I was part of the policy unit at that time in number 10, Downing Street. Um, and a member of the policy unit was leading this very energetic, kinetic figure called Daniel Korski, whom some of you will know. And Daniel embarked on this project with enormous gusto, going around British business and saying, listen, what can we get off our books? What can we remove to make uh, your lives easier? And the answer came back from the business community that there actually wasn't a whole load of stuff. And we sort of produced a few mice here and there. Um, but, you know, a bit of reach on the chemicals directive and, you know, one or two directives to do with uh, labor and so forth. But really it was a pretty pitiful contribution. So I'm gonna be watching um, IDS's Tiger Committee with great interest, because it's gonna be very uh, fascinating to see, how, see, what, what, see what it genuinely produces that the business community wants. So I think Harold, Harold Wilson had a bonfire of controls in 1949. I'm just, it's just in, in my brain there. Uh, Emily, would you like to uh, comment on that? I see that you've got your uh, 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 mute off. Yes. Um it was an interesting answer, Joe, but I didn't think it necessarily addressed the question, um, which was, uh, which is, can we be a global Britain if we are falling apart? And I think that it's going to be very difficult um, for us to, to be focused externally if we are trying to, to make sure that we don't fall apart, of course. But let's kind of, let's look at that in a slightly different way. How can we have, how can Scotland be global Scotland? if it breaks away from the rest of the United Kingdom. And I think that the answer that is given is, or will be part of the European Union. And then I think the question has to be, well, how will that happen? Will the European Union have you? you? Will it be that it will be seen that you will just simply be encouraging other countries to break up 
there are other countries where there are regions that are wanting to go independent. Doesn't that cause you trouble? Can you really be sure that you would be part of the European Union? And perhaps um, Nick can help us better than I can. But from what I understand, if they were to join the European Union, and then the question would be, what currency would they have? Would they have the pound? I don't know if we'd necessarily be that keen on that. But if they were to join the European Union, then would they join? Would they have a euro? But in order to have a euro, then don't they need to have a very large amount of money in the bank in order to be able to support their membership of the of the euro? And from what I understand, it's more than than the Scottish economy generates in a year in any event. So. Um, I just, I mean, I think that without doubt, it's a really important point, but it isn't just one for the UK government to be concerned about. It's also one, I think, for people within the other nations of the United Kingdom to be thinking about too, as to how international they can really be if they break away from the United Kingdom. But, you know, of course it will cause us huge difficulties. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, um, Gordon Carrera of the BBC asks, what if notions of a free trading global Britain look dated due to changing geopolitics, such as rising nationalism, but in particular systemic competition between the US and China, which forces us, like over Huawei, to choose sides in a more fractured world? And perhaps I could ask Jess if she would like to comment on that one. Sure. Thanks, John. So this rising competition, systemic competition on the geopolitical stage was a big part of why one of our report conclusions was that multilateralism, restarting the multilateral trading system in particular, wasn't going to happen anytime soon. Um, and instead, the push was rather than for going for bilateral deals or focusing on bilateral free trade agreements, Britain should seek to build plurilateral alliances, plurilateral trade platforms that remain open to build out further larger, um, larger players in the future. So um, an important additional thing to think about in that is that now we've got a change in the US administration, this question of China is gonna become more pertinent, both for the UK and for the EU, as um, there's increasing pressure to kind of take side. But broadly, the suggestion was that build plurilateral alliances, build plurilateral trade platforms, but keep the door open, make sure that those platforms can become inclusive, can become a future multilateral stage. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, uh, I've got Naomi Smith here, the Chief Executive of Best for Britain, who asks, the UK government would like to be seen as a world leader on environmental issues, and in particular, carbon reduction. How can this be squared with ever increasing trade with economies further away? What is the carbon impact of purchasing vegetables from Kenya rather than Catalonia? Maybe Sechi might like to answer that. We haven't heard from you yet. Um, sorry, could you just repeat the question, John? I certainly can. The UK government would like to be seen as a world leader on environmental issues, and in particular, carbon reduction. How can this be squared with ever increasing trade with economies further away? What is the carbon impact of purchasing vegetables from Kenya rather than Catalonia? Yeah, sure, thank you. So I think what we found in the paper was that a lot of our interviewees kind of reinforced and reiterated that whilst this government has kind of tried to look out for the rest of the world, that the EU is a really significant relationship for us and we should we should make sure that we don't like antagonize that relationship. And like, whilst we do other things, we should make sure that that remains a priority for us. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything to that answer. Another really important thing that a lot of our interviewees said was that a place where the UK can really lead is climate change. But an important part of that is that we need to be consistent in both our internal and external messaging. So if we're doing things that look like that's undermining that commitment to addressing the climate emergency, that will really affect the ability for global Britain to be an international leader in climate change. Thank you. I think the, I think the other thing to say, John, is that um, but it may be hard in the COP talks to build, to kind of get to really deep global solutions, but you can be plurilateral on climate change as well. You can build coalitions and actually, building a coalition with our European partners on next steps on climate change 
um, is a really kind of sensible for us, thing for us to be trying to um, to do. So, as Joe said, once you've left the European Union, it's easier to handle the migration debate because we're in control. And now we've left the European Union, it ought to be easier to handle our trading relationships with the European Union because we, we can put our national interests first. Our national interest is to have deep trading relationships with the European Union. And, um, and that is what we should be prioritising as much as small bilateral deals with further away countries, which actually may have an environmental impact, as Naomi says, but more importantly, will be tiny. If you look at the numbers, a 5% fall um, in EU trade would have to be compensated for by enormous increases, or five times that with our, um, our non-EU trading partners to, um, to compensate, because Europe is next door. Could I, can I add something as well, which is the, um, we're going to be doing two things. We're going to be chairing the G7 and we're going to be, and, and we're going to be hosting COPT. And the two things come together um, and we want to take a leading role in both. But actually, if you look at the, um, the and, and we have plans, you know, we have ambitious plans in the UK for getting down to zero um, net zero on uh, on carbon emissions in the UK. However, it's because most of our manufacturing happens elsewhere. And actually what we do is we offshore our carbon emissions to other countries. And actually, if you look, the two things come together in terms of COP and G7, because guess what? Which of the G7 countries produces the most, the most carbon offshore? It's us. You know, so although we may be able to smugly say we have a plan for getting down to net zero, in fact, it's only within our shores and not externally. And whilst I take on board what people have said about, about the European Union, there is, of course, going to be, I think there's moves within the European Union to, um, to try to deal themselves with, with offshoring of carbon. And there will be difficulties in terms of importing and exporting into the European Union because of carbon pricing. And so, and there will be, and that will be a, a tariff barrier, I mean, that will be a barrier for trade into the European Union. And the question for us will be, what do we do? <laughs> do we set up some sort of equivalent so that we're able to trade freely backwards and forwards with the EU? And where does that take us in terms of trade with many other countries? This is a, this is a, a another, um, you know, big iceberg <laughs> that's, uh, that, we're, that we're sailing towards and we will need to find out what we will need to work out what our solution to that is. Sorry, can I just add something else um, just to continue on this vein? What I think this question about the extent to which we use our external global Britain policy in order to achieve global aims such as resolving the climate change problem speaks to is the big diversity in forms of global Britain that can be headed towards. There is a version of global Britain in which you write a kind of pro forma trade agreement for a bilateral trade relationship with another country, which demands that they accede to a minimal level of environmental standards. And there is a global Britain in which you do not include those provisions in your trade arrangements. So I think what really should be explored is what kind of global Britain that we is it that we want? And how do we ensure that the policies that we use to enact global Britain meet the values that we kind of have at, in in different ways, particularly with regard to issues like climate, labor standards, um, but also which sectors we want to grow economically. And so Global Britain can match kind of the policy specification of whoever wants to take it on. That's right. And it's certainly a, a fight, which I alluded to in my, my initial remarks, is a fight that's happening in Parliament. There's a big debate happening about that. And what we do is we look at the um, rollover agreements that the government have agreed so far and look to see whether they've updated them or not, um, given current problems and, you know, and, and holding them to account on that, because I do think that that's an ongoing issue. You know, do we just sign up to Paris? Um, and then forget it, or do we make sure that our trade agreements actually underpin our commitments to, to the Paris Climate Change Agreement, for example? Okay, thank you. Um, question coming in from Conservative MP Stephen Hammond, who asks, uh, does the UK retain any significant soft or smart power? Does the panel think that 
Uh, does the panel think that can be aligned to tactical and collaborative uh, issues as per the narrative conclusion, or is that concept too imperial rather than global Britain? I'll come in on that, uh, John, if you want. I mean, I think um, the UK has got incredible soft power still. And to me, the clearest demonstration of that is our ability to attract tens of thousands of international students to study in this country every year. If you've got that, you've got something really special to persuade people to spend a lot of money, time, energy, particularly in, in, a, in a pandemic. Um, to come and study in your country. And the UK definitely has that. And that's obviously thanks to its great education system and great universities. But also it's because we've now put in place a sensible uh, regime to encourage them to invest their human capital in the UK economy post-graduation uh, with the post-study work visa that's thankfully been restored um, to, to a two-year period. Um, so that's absolutely critical that we take advantage of you know, the appeal of our universities to consolidate uh, that flow of brilliant people who come and then stay on after, after they graduate. And I'm really pleased that there is now uh, a consensus within the, within, well, across the political parties, but more, I think most importantly now that there's a consensus within the Conservative Party that international students um, are a good thing uh, on balance. That certainly wasn't the case uh, during the Theresa May a period in office when the policy was definitely to drive student numbers down and as, as part of a contribution towards meeting our ludicrous tens of thousands of net migration target. But I'm pleased that there is now this uh, consensus that international students are a good thing. I am concerned that it's a weak consensus though. And one of the points of fragility to go back to one of your earlier points um, relates to China. Um, China is obviously the country that sends most international students to the UK right now. And you know, within the Conservative Party, it's a bit of a virility test as to how hawkish you are on China. Um, and I'm worried that uh, we might inadvertently do ourselves uh, a, a real, real harm um, if we allow uh, flows of students uh, from China and other countries to be caught up in these uh, geopolitical tensions that are, that are arising at the moment. I, th I mean, I think the answer to Stephen's question, in a way, I know, I know Stephen well, and he 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 he's not falling into this trap, which I'm sure is why he asked the question. But um, what we can't afford to do is to carry on simply with a polarized binary debate. It says that if you are if you reject hubris or imperial Great Britain, that therefore you are defeatist and pessimistic and that you've given up. It's person, perfectly possible to be humble and to be a leader. Humble just means being understanding that you can't do it on your own. You need to work with other countries and build relationships and, and have partners, and that you shouldn't overclaim and underdeliver. You should do it the other way round. There is no reason why we can't be proud of our strengths and actually go out and sell them to the world. Um, but, but, but you have to, to earn that, as one of the quotes said, you have to earn the right to lead and to demonstrate. If Britain can show that we can reconcile globalization and regional divides and say there is a way to share prosperity, loads of other countries are looking to see how to do that. But if we can find a way to um, manage our financial sector in a stable and prosperous way, loads of other countries are trying to do the same thing. So of course we can demonstrate but you don't have to do it in a hubristic way. You don't have to assert we've always been and we are restored as Great Britain. You don't have to reject the European Union relationship and say it's okay because we can return to the Commonwealth. It's, it's the backward looking nature of that. But I think it, it's very dangerous. If we define global Britain as being hubristic and everybody who doesn't sign up to that vision is a pessimist um, and a defeatist, then we've just not got beyond 2016. Thank you. Uh, Nick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fire this one at you. Uh, Professor David Edgerton of King's says, uh, asks, for what reasons, if any, should we think of Germany, France or India as less global than Britain? 
Well, I think, um, you know, uh, Britain uh, is, um, is global, but then every country, um, apart from, you know, uh, uh, the, the, you know, Burma or whatever, it, I forget its mm. modern name. That's the one. That's the one. I mean, look, all countries are outgoing. All countries are trying to um, do well in the world. Um, Britain happens to have um, a global reach, partly reflecting its history. But Germany has a bigger global reach because it's got a more successful economy. And um, it's more, because it still has a big manufacturing base, it's more tangible. Um, the thing about services is they tend to be rather intangible, but that doesn't mean that we're not important. And I think that I take to understand why politicians have to package a message to show that they are trying to promote Britain in the world and appeal to people's patriotism. But there's nothing wrong. Um, I, I don't subscribe to the um, Samuel Johnson view of patriotism. Um, there's nothing wrong with trying to appeal to a, a future. I mean, I, 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 I'm, but I am slightly in Ed Ball's camp in that you've got to look forward. And I think Britain and its politicians and above all its media is too stuck in with the symbols of the past. And the nostalgia industry, certainly in my lifetime, has taken hold big time. When I was a child, people really didn't want to talk about their war experiences. Now the Telegraph and the Times and their obituary columns just every day want to have some new hero who probably didn't regard himself or herself as a hero at all. So we we do need to look forward. And I mean, whether we should be humble or not, I don't know. Um, I think a little humility does go a long way. But we are a medium-sized power. We happen to be... Um, on the UN Security Council for historic reasons, and we have an important role at Bretton Woods institutions like the IMF and NATO and so on. But so do Germany, so does France, so does Italy. And um, we kind of got to recognise that the way to get on is by working with other countries. I mean, take take the environment and, and climate change. I mean, look, the plain, we may be chairing COP, but the plain fact is that anything which happens there will be down to the United States. The United States is the swing factor here. It is by far more powerful than, um, than us, and China will be the other big player. So we've got to be nimble. We've got to be agile. We've got to try and use our influence. We've got to form alliances with our, the, the countries which are closest to us, both economically, culturally, um, and in terms of trade, which is France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and we've got to move on. Um, now, um, that will happen. I'm absolutely confident that will happen. History suggests you get, you know, the pendulum swings. At the moment, we are at our most distant from our friends in Europe, but that will change. Um, you know, the economic forces will ensure it changes. And you can play the... You can play the nationalist chart card. You know, Joseph Chamberlain did a very good job of it in the 1890s and 1900s, and his son managed to implement, implement protection in, um, in 1931. But um, the, the, the pendulum will, will, will swing back because it is in our economic interest. We are a free trading nation. We have to reduce trade barriers, ideally multilaterally, the obsession with bilateralism, I regret, but it's a necessity in the current environment. I like a bit of plurilateralism, if we can have some of that. But we've got to remain open and outward looking and approach that with a degree of common sense and even humility. OK, I've got a question on London here. Uh, so uh, who, uh, tell me who'd like to answer that from uh, the Strand Group's own Dr Jack Brown, who says, what role do the panel think that London, arguably the UK's only truly global city and the source of so much of its tax base, 
has to play in global Britain, particularly given the levelling up agenda, which rightly emphasises the need to address regional inequalities, but perhaps also risks shifting focus and investment away from the post-pandemic capital. Shall I answer this as a, L a London MP? Because I, I, I love my city and I agree with what's said, that we are, you know, we're a world city, that, uh, that we're that we have as much in common perhaps with some of the other great global cities around the world and you compare it to some of the other places in the UK, maybe we have more in common with those cities than we do with some of the others. And that I think is getting decreasingly true. <laughs> I think that actually things are really changing and I think that the internationalism that you see in London is you're seeing much more in other, town, other cities and large towns across the UK these days. Um, and, you know, certainly when I was a kid, you, you would get some people saying, well, I'm a Londoner, but they wouldn't necessarily say that they were British. They felt more international and a Londoner than they did anything else. But I think that that is now changing. Um, and I mean, I just can I just take take just 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 go a little bit further from from what uh, from what Nick was saying. I mean, the other thing that that, uh, of course, makes does is an exceptional um, aspect of our country which makes us more easily international is is that we we all speak English and that I think is just a, a you know a passport in um, everywhere and obviously that happens across the whole of the UK but I do think that we as a nation are changing very much I think you know as I think is referred to in the report you know there was the um, you know the disaster of the of uh, of, of of the hostile um, culture and so on, and um, and the terrible bad publicity that came about that, and the injustices that were caused to individuals as a result of the hostile environment. Um, but as a general trend, I think that we become increasingly international, increasingly tolerant, and frankly, an example to the world. And uh, that's one of the things you know. We're talking about soft power; it's pretty strong soft power to me. Well, following, following up on that question, um, former student Angus Gillen uh, says, the Prime Minister has called himself uh, fervently Sinophile at a number 10 round table with Chinese businesses in recent days. Following uh, Emily Thornbury's statement that global Britain, to her and many others, means voicing support for an international rules-based order and acting in such a way to secure this, how should global Britain approach a future relationship with China, notably in light of Uyghur human rights violation and disregard for the rule of law in Hong Kong? Is there an Asia-Pacific economic strategy you would advocate? Anyone fancy that one? I mean, I'll have a go. I mean, I think, you know, the reality is if we follow a hard Brexit with Chexit, then global Britain's going to be an, en an airplane that's dropped both engines. I mean, so I'm very pleased that the Prime Minister describes himself as a Sinophile because he's facing, as I said earlier, you know, a Conservative Party for, for which, you know, Sinophobia is the new Euroscepticism. It's the new, it's the best of political machismo. Uh, but of course, it would be economic madness to decouple from China, um, you know, and it would, it would be incredibly destructive of this whole idea of global Britain because... There are many countries around the world, not just the Belt and Road countries, many countries across the global south who are increasingly interdependent with China. There won't be a global Britain if we're not engaging with China and with all the other countries who are trading with it and, and increasingly in economically enmeshed with it. So we've got to find a modus vivendi that's consistent with our values and our interests. Um, but a, uh, an abrupt decoupling from China would be absolutely disastrous, um, you know, in so many ways. I, I completely think, agree. Sorry, I, I, just, I, mean, I do think that the swaying, the swerving that has happened within the Conservative Party during its time in government has been giddying, frankly. Um, I mean, you know, when, when Osborne went out to China, the, 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 the national newspapers that run by the Chinese Communist Party that were, were, were making a comment about how 
how great it was that at long last there was a leader coming out to China that wasn't publicly uh, criticizing their human rights record. And indeed, you know, same thing happened um, you know, with the next prime minister as well. And now we, you know, having had having had those, you know, sort of two leaders and so Theresa May and Cameron, you know, taking the attitude that yes, we want to have a partnership with China, but we must not in any way upset them by 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 being by 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 standing up for what it is that we that we think are, is important. We now have it, the pendulum swinging completely the other direction, where you have a very hard anti-China lobby within the Tory party that's becoming increasingly powerful. I would just have a plea, which is please just, if you're the government of the United Kingdom, just be consistent. Be consistent with your values and be clear to China where you disagree. But of course, we don't turn our back on China. You know, but, we, but we have to be prepared to say when we disagree but you know, of course we do, and 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 just so that people are, are aware, there is uh, again. I was talking about the you know the trade bill that's been going on for three four years now. Um, the the final gasp, the final vote on the on the trade bill is going to be about essentially about China, and about uh, the Uyghurs. Um, there was, I could see there's a question in the chat about that, um, and whether or not there should be it should be taken out of the government's hands to decide whether or not um, any country was guilty of genocide. Um, it obviously is pointed towards China and the, and the Uyghurs, um, and the government is uh, is fighting back on that. The suggestion has been from the House of Lords on a number of occasions now um, that um, the High Court should make a decision, a declaration as to whether or not there has been um, genocide committed, because legally it's only a court can decide that. And then in those circumstances, the British government wouldn't be allowed to make a trade deal with them. That's essentially what, just so people know. And of course, there is a big question mark over CPTPP, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which China has applied to join and Britain has applied to join. Who knows how that's going to end? OK, I'm going to ask uh, two final questions. I'm going to aim them at uh, Ed and uh, maybe you can sum up as well, Ed. OK, so uh, Peter Hayden asks, the report contains and the panellists have used the words humility and hubris a lot which is music to the ears of us who dislike the English nationalists and who believe in nemesis. To what extent do the panelists believe that the extreme hubris of this government will make the humility you suggest they require simply beyond their reach with all the consequences that will entail? And a current uh, postgraduate student, Patrick Law asks, are there examples from the past where we have been humble and subtle and gained influence? What can we learn from these examples in terms of gaining influence? Which prime ministers can we look to in modelling this type of behaviour? Ed. I think um, this goes to the kind of the debate about the nature and the unity of our, um, our political parties, and their ability to have a sort of cohesive, united view. Um, in that list of one of the previous questions, which Nick responded to, People talked about um, global Germany, global France, uh, global India. Nobody said global America. But I think in the last um, four years, global America has not really been how America has been run. It was much more America first, withdrawing from multilateralism, much more antagonistic and adversarial in terms of its economic and wider relationships. And that's a very big difference from the America of the past. If you take the China issue, you know, when we were coming into government, George Bush Senior, through Bill Clinton, into George Bush Junior, were the people who drew economically China into the new G20, an American idea, bringing them into the multilateral conversation. It wasn't that they were going to agree with everything China said, but they wanted to have them round the table to be part of the debate and the argument, and sometimes the the, the, the challenge. And so global America is not how it's not how it's been. Now, the question for the Conservatives at the moment is, are they going to be more global Britain? Or are they going to more be more Trumpian and Britain first? And that kind of British Britain first antagonism, that sort of bilateralism, that disdain for multilateralism, whether that is dealing with the EU or more widely, I mean, you know, that isn't global Britain. And the Prime Minister is going to have to, to decide whether there is a tension between 
little Englishism and a global view. There is a, you can, we can have very legitimate debates about how to make global Britain work, but Britain first nationalism is not consistent with global um, Britain. The answer to your question, John, is if you take the, the, um, the shaping of um, the Britain was institutions in 1944-45, Britain was at the heart of that, but never assumed the leadership role. Um, and I would say that has often been the approach which we've taken on sort of international economic uh, issues. We went out of our way in the global financial crisis to make uh, the G20 something which was led by um, George Bush Jr., Obama, Sarkozy, Merkel, as much as the um, UK, because you needed um, all those countries around the, the table. But if you take the single European Act, one of the great European reforms of the last 40 years, Margaret Thatcher was at the centre of that, but, um, but it wasn't a Britain first initiative. It was about making the European economy more effective. So there is a, um, a Labour and a Conservative um, piece of leadership which showed some, some, hum some humility. Um, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the last 30 years, and also those Bretton Woods um, uh, kind of reforms. The question is, is Boris Johnson going to have the strength to, elect, to reject Britain first English nationalism and be genuinely a global Britain leader? I mean, I might still disagree with him on lots of things, but what a relief that would be. Um, I think the union can't be sold unless he's willing to do that. He may not be fully believed. And then when it comes to Labour, we can have legitimate arguments with the Conservatives about, um, about the detail. But I think Labour has also got to own global Britain, a Labour version of global Britain, not English nationalism, not Britain first, but global Britain. I don't think we can save the union unless we persuade um, all the constituent parts of the union that they are stronger in the world, whether that's with Europe or internationally on progressive reform by being together rather than apart. Aside from the points Emily said to it right about the economic cost of Scotland from, um, from separation, we have to win the argument that Britain is stronger globally by being together. And that is the opposite of English nationalism. And I don't think we'll win those arguments and show success unless we combine leadership and ambition and some humility. And we've done it before and we can do it again. And I don't think uh, we'll pass next ta tests on growth or the union unless we do. So I think the gauntlet is down to Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer. We want a debate about the right kind of global Britain. Okay. I think that, that finishes our session. Uh, thank you very much, Nyesha. Tommaso, Sechi, Jess, uh, Lord Johnson, Lord McPherson, Emily Thornbury and Professor Balls for a great session. Thank you to all for participating. See you next time. Thank you.